fall of 1997, the world stopped. Um, I don't know if many of you remember 1997 at all. I was, uh, I was still in high school at that point in time. But Princess Diana had just died. And everybody, uh, seemingly, at least in the United States, I don't know what the European scene was except for what they showed on TV, everybody just stopped. We, we mourned, we wept Princess Diana's funeral. The service was held at the Westminster Abbey, which is, of course, the, the greatest place and the most significant place that you can hold a, a service over there. And, and thousands came and gave tribute. They dumped off flowers and, and gifts, and they wrote these little messages for the royal family, which was interesting. One of the parts of the funeral service was Elton John was asked to come up and to perform, to sing and write. Actually, he wrote an original song for the service called Candle in the Wind. You guys remember, it's a very popular song now. And the refrain of the song is very, very beautiful. It's a beautiful song, but it tells you a lot about Elton John's philosophy on hope and death and really our world's philosophy on how we treat death when we encounter it and what hope we do have in this world. The refrain that was repeated at the end of the song over and over again, your candle burned out long before your legend ever did. Your candle burned out long before your legend ever did. And it was a really sad song. Ultimately pictures life as a candle. A candle has a wick and it burns. And we don't know when the wick is going to burn out, but ultimately it does burn out. And after that, it's over. There's nothing more. Hopefully you've done enough in life that you will leave some kind of testimony, some kind of legacy to the next generation. As somebody wrote a piece for Princess Di's funeral after that, ran in most of the newspapers, some of the magazine articles ran this, and it was a little bit of a different philosophy on death, a little bit of a different view. And it says this, so it was a poem, and it goes, Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glints on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I do not die. And this is a much more popular view of death and hope. It's the New Age view. It's the reincarnation, kind of a Buddhist view of death, that you don't really die. Death is just a figment of your imagination. It's just a passing on into the next world of existence for you. If people say this at funerals a lot. Um, he's in a much better place now. Doesn't it, doesn't it bless your heart to know that he or she is in a much better place? They don't even know if they're believers or not. This is, this is kind of this new age reincarnation philosophy. And here's the problem with both views. Uh, Rene Descartes summarizes this well in his Enlightenment philosophy. He says this, of all the things that we can perceive, know, and love, none of them is so certain as that we exist. The Enlightenment philosophy was built on self. It's built on the thought that we can't know anything in life other than that we're breathing and we're here, that we exist. Everything else, if it can be proved by science, I'll take it as true. Anything else that's subjective, we don't really know. Everything comes down to self-existence for this philosophy. Man by nature is in a quest for himself. But beyond you, beyond your life, there really is no hope. There's nothing after death. Moltmann got to the heart of this in his theology of hope. He describes it. He says, eschatology in this view, both of these views that I described, has wholly lost its sense as a goal of history and is in fact understood as the goal of the individual human being. So our greatest eschatological hope is ourselves. And what can we make of ourselves in this life? After that, it's gone. Now, 1 Peter is a book that's grounded in hope. So far, we've started this chapter one. We've seen three elements of this hope. We started out and we talked about the living hope that comes through the new birth of, in Jesus Christ. That led to a redeeming hope. We've seen the story of Scripture that gives a, a redemptive hope, not only in our lives from beginning to end, but from the beginning to end of history. Genesis to Revelation, there's a redeeming hope that's spelled out in story form. Uh, God is not just arbitrarily orchestrating some kind of 
uh, meticulous, this event here, that event there, haphazard series of events. God has actually authored a story, a redemptive story, with a narrative thread. And it tells the story of how things went wrong and how Jesus will ultimately make everything right through his story of redemption, through his son Jesus and his death on the cross. Today, a living hope, a redeeming hope, today I want to explore a growing hope. As a Christian, you grow, and your, and your hope naturally grows from things in this world to things in eternity. Hopefully, they grow. There's, there's probably a test, actually, if you have a growing hope or if you don't have a growing hope. And the test is how you age, right? And so some people, as they age, they get old and they get bitter. Other people, as they age, they get old and they get better. People who age, who get old and get bitter, they see their their life is shorter. And so they want everything to be just how they want it to be. They're going to complain a lot. And when things don't go their way, they're going to get very bitter about those things. You see this all the time. Other people, as they, as they grow old, they get better. And the thing is, they see the same thing. Their earthly life is coming closer to an end than it ever has come before, but they see the hope that's before them. And so they settle into this existence and this reality that there is life after them. C.S. Lewis, um, he talks about this in his life. He pursued this world's hopes and everything that they had to offer until he realized that nothing would ultimately fulfill his greatest joys and his greatest hopes. He writes this. He says, I had tried everything in my own mind and body, as it were, asking myself, is this what you want? Is this it? And I saw that all my waitings and watchings for joy, all my vain hopes to find some mental content on which I could, so to speak, lay my finger and say, this is it, had been a futile attempt. He said, I knew now that they were merely the mental track left by the passage of joy. Not the wave, but the wave's imprint on the sand. He says, the inherent dialectic of desire itself, in a way, already shown me this. For all images and sensations, if idolatrously mistaken, soon honestly confess themselves inadequate. And all of them said in the last resort, it is not I. I am only a reminder. Look, look, what do I remind you of? The C.S. Lewis goes through all of life, and he has these little faint pictures of hope. Finally, he realizes that none of them will ultimately give him hope, but all of them will point to the ultimate hope that will only sustain. If you look for hope in something, you will never find it. If you look for hope in someone, you will never lose it. Do you have a dying hope or do you have a growing hope? First Peter chapter 1, number 1 in your outline. Where is hope, where is change pressing in First Peter chapter 1? We look for these things, we look for hope, we look to change and to grow. So where is change pressing? Look at verse 22, First Peter chapter 1. Verse 22. Peter writes, having purified your souls by obedience to the truth, you might just bracket that little phrase there, obedience to the truth. For sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Now, where is change pressing? Peter's answer is that change is pressing in how you love, how you love one another. And it's also pressing at the very end of verse 22, there's a a place that change is pressing, and that is your heart, a pure heart. Here's why we need change in our lives, and here's why we need hope. We don't know how to love. We don't know how to love people. We don't know how to love one another. We don't even know how to love ourselves. Apart from God, there is no true love. Love is, is a love by name only. It's a cheap knockoff. It's not the real thing. Peter says the only way that you can know sincere love, the only way that you can know true love, is if you experience it, if you know it through the gospel. And he'll talk about the sincere love over and over again. King James Version is the only version that doesn't say sincere there. King James Version will say unfeigned love. And the Greek word for sincere, unfeigned in the text, is you'll you'll hear the English in it, anhupakritas, 
It is unhypocritical. To have a sincere love and unfeigned love is to not be hypocritical, is to be sincere about how we love, who we love, and what motivates our love. All love, apart from God, is hypocritical for one reason, sin. Because of sin, no one loves selflessly. Everyone loves selfishly. We love people for what we can get out of it. We love people and things for what they can give to us. And here's why you need to le- read The Lord of the Rings if you haven't read it yet. J.R.R. Tolkien, when he writes, every, I've said this before, if you stack up all the books that have been written in the last hundred years on romance, the stack would be endlessly high. If you stacked up all the books that have been written in the last hundred years on friendship, on how to love a friend, you would have just a handful of them. J.R.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, he writes about sincere brotherly love, the kind of love that First Peter is talking about in this book. One writer puts it this way, the first and most obvious answer why nobody cares about friendship love is that few value it because few experience it. Friendship is the least natural of the loves. It is the least instinctive, the least organic, biological, gregarious, and it is the least necessary. It has the least commerce with our nerves. He says, there's nothing throaty about it, nothing that quickens the pulse. And so we want to we make friends, all of us. want to have meaningful friendships, college friendships, high school friendships that last for the rest of our lives. And so some of us walk out the front door and we say, I need a friend. I need to make a friend. You will never make a true friend by looking for a friend. That's not how it works. True and real friendships are built on a commonality. There is something that unites you in your friendships. And so you pursue your desires, the things that you love. A good friendship in Kansas is on tractors, you know, Let's talk about some cars. Man, I'm a, I'm a motorhead, and this guy's a motorhead. Hey, you want to come see my shotgun? It's, it is sweet. My work just gave me a brand new $600 shotgun. You need to come see this and fire this thing. And so this friendship comes around. It's built on these commonalities, these common elements. Here's what Peter's saying. Sincere love sees the same thing in one another. True friends don't ask, do you love me? Will you be my friend? True friends ask, do you see the same thing? And a true Christian friend loves one another because they see the same thing about one thing, about the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a commonality that we have in our friendships that enables us to sincerely love one another. We are united by the death of resurrection in the love of Jesus Christ on our behalf um, to take care of our sin. Where is change pressing and needed in our life? In our friendships, in the way we love. It's also pressing in its location, in its seat. Look at the end of verse 22. Love one another, Peter exhorts us, earnestly from a pure heart. What we said is that real love has its source in Jesus in the gospel. It has its seat in the heart. Peter says, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. And herein lies the problem. Our hearts aren't pure all the time, every time. Listen to Ecclesiastes 9, verse 3. The hearts of the children of man are full of evil. Madness is in their hearts while they live. And so in our house, uh, weekly, we have a routine that we do. Every single week we do this routine, it's the same thing. On Wednesday night, we get together. The kids are involved. The parents are involved. We stop everything that we are doing because of this weekly cycle that we do at our house. We go through each and every room of our house. We find the waste baskets. We find the garbage. We find the trash. I don't know if any of you guys know this. I'm a, I have a master's degree from Dallas Theological Seminary. You know, great and wise things that other people don't know. One of those great and wise things that I know that other people don't know is that My family produces trash all the time. It's everywhere in our house. There is an endless cycle of picking up trash and taking it out. And so Wednesday night, here's what we do. We go through all of our house, each room. 
we gather up the trash, and we take it out to the curb. Trash is not that big of a deal as long as we're aware of it and we know what to do with it when we find it. It's the same with our hearts. It's the same with sin and purity in our hearts. It's not that big of a deal as long as you're aware of it and when you find it, you know what to do with it. You know, why is it this way? Why didn't God just give us a, a completely pure heart and let us have pure intentions, pure thoughts, pure motives for everything that we could do? He gave us the gospel, right? Why couldn't Jesus give us a pure heart? And the answer is he actually did. Scripture says he took all of our hearts of stone and gave us a heart of flesh. He completely transformed our hearts. And one day, we're going to get a brand new heart. It is going to be completely restored for God's kingdom and for his purposes and ultimately for his glory. But until that day comes, we got to take the trash out of our hearts. Sin will come into our hearts on a daily and a weekly basis. If we know what to do with it, it'll make all the difference in the world. Listen, your biggest problems in life are not social, financial, or physical the biggest problems in your life are spiritual. And the biggest spiritual problem that you have in your life is not your relationships. It is not your job and your career or your cars or your money or your bank accounts. The biggest spiritual problem that you have in your life is your own heart. The biggest spiritual problem I have in my life is me in my heart. Sin is not exclusive of persons. Sin invades Every person's heart, we are all bent towards sin, even after we trust the gospel. Where is change needed the most? It's needed in our hearts. And how do we change? Peter tells us how we change. Verse 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. Obedience to the truth is the test of a pure heart. It's so simple, but it is so hard to do this on a daily basis. Growing hope is submissive to the truth of God's word. Either you are going to be the authority of your life and you are going to do what you want to do when you want to do it in your way. Or God's word is going to be the authority of your life. And you're going to do what he wants you to do when he wants you to do it in his way. The choice is very simple. On a day-to-day basis, it is the Christian life. It is a struggle. Where is change pressing? Change is pressing in the heart. Number two, how is change possible? How does hope grow? Look at verse 23, 1 Peter chapter 1. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and the glory of, is like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. My dad was a super cheap guy growing up as a kid in his house. Henry and Ethan, I know you guys think I don't give you anything, you know, anywhere close to what I had from my dad. We had four kids in our family. And when my sister was in middle school, I was the youngest of the four. This um, game system came out. You might have heard something about it. It's called Nintendo. And Nintendo came out when my sister was in middle school. And there was no way dad was going to buy a Nintendo for us. Absolutely no way. We had one TV in the house. It was a color TV. It stood on the floor, and it was encased in this big wooden frame. You guys know those big TVs? If you wanted to go to the TV and change the channel, you had to get up out of your seat and go push the buttons on it. It was remarkable. And so the kids wanted to hook up the Nintendo to the family TV. Dad said, "Uh uh-uh, not going to happen. So for a year and a half... All four of us, brothers and sisters, saved up our allowance money until we could afford Super, or Nintendo. And we bought Super Mario Brothers, Rad Racer, and you guys are tracking with me, and Excite Bike. Those are our, our three original Nintendo games. And the thing I loved about Nintendo, it wasn't a, it wasn't a hard system at all. I think it was like a two-bit system. I don't know what, they're, what they have out there now. I don't even know. I'm, I'm kind of talking out of my out of my peripheral anyway, but it was a very simple system. And on the, on the Nintendo, you had two buttons, 
power with a little red indicator light next to it, I told you when the power was on, and the reset button right next to it. And we loved playing Nintendo. We hated dying. You got like three lives in Super Mario Brothers, so you hated to die. But there was always the reset button. No matter how bad it was in Nintendo, no matter how bad you were doing, you could get up any second in the game, you could hit the reset button, and you could start all over. The new birth is just like this, all right? The new birth not only says you can reset your life and you can start all over, the new birth says that death is actually one of the best things that you could go through. The new birth Only life through new birth will only come through death first. You have to die to self before you can hit the reset button of the new birth. And now you have a new life. Now you can start all over. Death is is the reset button in the gospel, and it leads to a new life. Peter is going to pick up this concept in in Isaiah. He's actually going to quote out of Isaiah 40, which is one of the most influential chapters in all of the Old Testament. And 1 Peter chapter 1 and Isaiah 40 have a lot of commonalities. There's a lot of things that they share together. I want to talk about just a few of them. First of all, I want to uh, look at the beginning of verse 24. All right. Now, Peter writes to exiles when he's writing 1 Peter 1. Isaiah, original readers, would have been those in Babylonian exile. Peter writes to those who are under wicked rulers, evil government. He writes to those who are suffering. Isaiah, chapter 40, writes to those who are under wicked rulers, evil government, and to those who are suffering. The commonalities, what they share between Isaiah 40 and 1 Peter is actually shocking. Look at the beginning of verse 24. He says, all flesh. Look at the beginning of verse 25. But the word of the Lord. There's a huge comparison between the beginning of verse 24 and the beginning of verse 25. You have hope in man in all flesh, and you have hope in the Lord, in the word of the Lord and God's promises. There's one more similarity between Isaiah 40 and 1 Peter chapter 1, though. Both Isaiah and Peter will eventually move to the gospel. At the, at the end of verse 25, you probably, this is the word, this And this word is the good news that was preached to you. He's talking about the gospel there. Listen to Isaiah 40, verse 9. It says this. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice with strength. O Jerusalem, herald of good news. Lift it up. Fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. The greatest hope for exiles in 1 Peter is the gospel. The greatest hope for exiles in Isaiah chapter 40, is the gospel, the message of the coming king. But that's not what today's culture tells us. It tells us a different gospel. It tells us a different narrative. Today's culture has a baseline cultural narrative that is telling you this. Your greatest hope is found if you could only discover yourself. Look to your deepest desires, your wildest dreams, Don't worry what other people say about it. Don't let them challenge you. Don't let them come in the way of your dreams, right? Your greatest hope, the cultural narrative says, lies within you, within your heart, within your abilities. So let me give you an illustration here. I want you to imagine two boys. I want you to imagine this first boy is raised in Syria. We just talked about war-torn Syria. And this boy is captured by militants, Muslim militants, He has two desires in his heart. From a young age, all he knows is being raised in a Muslim militant with other boys and with men over him. He has two desires. One of his desires is that he wants to smash things and shoot guns all day long. All right, Henry has this desire as well. He's asking me for airsoft guns guns like every day of my life. Thank you, Wade and Denise. You have ruined my child. All right. This boy in Syria has a, has a desire. He wants to smash things and shoot guns. He has another desire, too, because he's raised by men and boys, and that's a desire for the same sex. To one desire, the desire to shoot guns and to smash things, he says, yep, that's really me. 
That's the desire that I'm going to find my identity in. To the other desire, homosexual relationships said, no, that's, that's not really me. I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to um, redirect that desire into a different avenue. Now, I want you to imagine another boy. This boy grows up in San Francisco. He also grows up with two men in his home, two dads in his home. He has the very same two desires. He has a desire to smash things and shoot guns, and he has another desire. It's a homosexual desire. To the desire to smash things and shoot guns, he says, nope, that's not me. That's not what I want to do. To the desire for a homosexual relationship, says, yep, that's me. I'm going to give in to that desire. Now, what is this teaching? You do not get your identity or your hope from within you. There is no way. The baseline cultural narrative that says, look within you, dream, you can do whatever you want to do apart from what anybody else thinks, apart from any influence on culture or society whatsoever, is patently impossible. Nobody lives in a vacuum. Nobody lives on an island. Nobody is not influenced by their culture and their society in some kind of a way. And this story is just plain, plainly evident. You see this all the time happening in our world today. There is no way. We have to have a grid to filter our desires and to redirect them where they need to go. What does this have to do with a growing hope in First Peter? Growing hope doesn't ask, who am I? Growing hope asks, whose am I? And if my desires and my longings are ultimately landed in the question of who am I, whatever the desire of my heart for that day, that's who I'm going to be, and that's where I'm going to find my identity. But if my desires and my heart is grounded in this question of whose am I, then my desires And my heart, my emotions, and my feelings are always going to be redirected back to the authority of God and the sovereignty and and his goodwill for us. Understand what Peter is saying in this comparison between flesh, man, and God, our ultimate hope, the word of the Lord and the promises. You can anchor your hope in things that die. You can anchor your hope in your culture, in your society, in your surrounding world. Peter could have used any reference to say their hope He uses grass and flowers that fade and die. He could have used anything. But he says, hope can either lie in yourself or it can lie outside of yourself. Hope is either found within you or it's found above you. And the Christian call because of the new birth and the hope that we have is to find our greatest identity, our greatest desires in Jesus and his will and his word. Our hope is not ultimately in a change of circumstances. Isaiah's circumstance never changed. Peter's circumstance never changed when he wrote. But if there's hope that was outside of them, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. He could have a a wholehearted existence that was for the glory of God. Where is change pressing? Where is hope pressing? It's pressing in the heart. How is change possible? Change is possible when we find our hope outside of ourselves, not inside of ourselves. Number three, where is change practical? And this is the hardest part of the text this morning. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and slander. And let me slow down and read that one more time. Put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy, and envy, and slander. Malice is the desire to do evil. It is ill will against somebody else. Deceit is deceiving somebody by withholding the truth, not giving them the full truth. Hypocrisy, envy, slander, all of these sins are rooted in the individual heart. You won't find these sins outside of you and know them completely like you will find them inside of you. But all these sins have something else in common. They're all very relational, They all have to do with the community and how we interact among one another. One commentator calls these sins the forces that destroy fellowship. You want to destroy fellowship in the church? Have at malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander all day long. But look at the verb. Look at what Peter asks us to do. He says, put away. Some of your translations might have something a little bit different there. It's not a command in the New Testament. 
It's not an imperative at all. It's actually a past tense participle. It's an aorist participle in Greek. And we would, we would read it this way to be more theologically accurate. Since you have already put away all malice, all deceit, all envy, what is it going to say? I lost my place. Hypocrisy and slander. Since you already have put these things away, when did we do that? The second you trusted the gospel. You put it away, and now you have a new identity in Christ. And so here's what Peter is ultimately saying. He's saying the positional power of the gospel, whose you are, should transform your relationships, how you interact with people. They should transform your struggles that you have in your life. Where is change practical then? It's practical in your homes, with your kids, with your wife, in your school, in your workplace. It is practical. Change is practical on the relational level, dealing with other people. Look at verse 2. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. When um, Ethan was a little kid, we were just talking about this this week, he did the funniest thing. Ethan is, uh, he's my six-year-old, about to turn six. He's five right now. And Ethan is, uh, he waited like 16 or 17 months to start talking. We, we were kind of worried about him. Didn't know if, what, what was going to come around. We start, got some help for him for speech and stuff like that. Um, he was exceptional at eating, though. And he did the funniest thing in his high chair. We take, when we ate at our house, the kids at that age, you get so messy, you just take off all their clothes. They sit there in a diaper. So he takes off all of his clothes, and he pokes out his stomach in the high chair, and he holds on to his hands, and he knows. This is like the stage between uh, liquids and solids, where you're giving them like the pureed baby, fu- baby food and oatmeal and all the really good stuff. Um, it, it's not good at all. It's horrible. I don't know how my kids eat this stuff. It's It's bad. So Ethan sits back in his high chair, and he closes his eyes, and he holds his hand on his stomach, and he he opens his mouth, and he waits for the food to go in. (laughs) And when the food goes in, he closes his mouth, and he's he's got like two teeth. He closes his mouth, and he does this. He goes, "Mm." and he opens his mouth again, "Mm." and he got this little silly grin on his face. And we're like, this kid's in hog heaven right now. This is the best thing we could do for him is to give him this food. Now, if you didn't get the next spoon in his mouth in time, it wasn't, mm, it was, ah, feed me. I need food right now. It was, it was hilarious. The loudest screams that we got with Ethan was when we didn't shovel in the food fast enough for him. He longed for food. He loved food. And we, we talk about it. We still laugh about it. Even today, long for the spiritual food. The Greek word for longing is epipatheo. Pathos is a Greek word for longing, desire. It's a yearning. When you add that epi prefix to it, it makes it even stronger. It's like a super desire, an overlonging, um, an abundant yearning for spiritual food, for spiritual milk. Without spiritual milk, your Christianity will starve, and you will cry out. You will cry out, and you don't even realize that you're crying out. Let me give you two major connections in this context. First, spiritual in verse 2, like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk, is connected back to chapter 1, verse 23, where Peter talks about the living and abiding word. Spiritual, the Greek word for spiritual is lagikos, the word for the word is lagos. So the spiritual lagikos comes from the living lagos, the living word. Spiritual milk comes from the living word. But there's another connection. Drinking, verse 2, long for the pure spiritual milk, something that you drink, is connected to tasting in verse 3. If you have tasted that the Lord is good. There's a a huge connection in Scripture between the Word of God, taking in the Word, and knowing the goodness of God. A huge connection. In fact, the goodness of God, many people have argued 
that that could be the starting place for all of theology. And some people, their starting place for all theology is the sovereignty of God. Amen to that. Could be that way. Could be the, the kingdom of God. Could be that way. But the goodness of God is, is also, my favorite writer on the goodness of God is C.S. Lewis. And it's not because of Mr. Beaver. Safe. Who said anything about being safe? Of course he's not safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. The goodness of God, C.S. Lewis writes about it, in a, grief, in a grief observed. Who is Peter writing to in this context? Peter is writing to exiles. Who is he writing to? He's writing to those who are suffering. First Peter is the book of hope. But he is writing to people who are suffering for their faith, who are encountering, encountering insurmountable trials. And he's telling them to buck up. You're a pilgrim. You're an exile. No matter what they do to you here, God is still good. And he's going to deliver you ultimately from whatever you have in your life. And so God is good to allow suffering. He is good to allow various trials into our life. Here's what Lewis says. What do people mean when they say, I'm not afraid of God because I know he's good? Have they ever been to the dentist before? He writes, the tortures occur. Suffering occurs with Christians. If they are unnecessary, then there is no God or an extremely bad one. But if there is a good God, then these tortures are necessary. C.S. Lewis lost his life, his, uh, his life, his wife, very early on in marriage. Never had any kids. Uh, they married within three years. She had a medical diagnosis. Uh, she died immediately. And C.S. Lewis couldn't stand it. He struggled with it. And so he wrote this like 75-page essay called A Grief Observed. And all he wanted to do, all C.S. Lewis wanted to do, was to step in the place for his wife and suffer for her instead. That's all he wanted to do. And he wrote about it in this, di- in this diary. And he says this, If I could only bear it, or the worst of it, or any of it, instead of her. But one can't tell how serious that bit is, because nothing is staked on it. If suddenly it became a reality, if suddenly it became possible for C.S. Lewis to suffer for his wife instead, for the first time, he would discover how serious he had meant it. But is it ever allowed? Are we ever allowed to suffer in the place of another? It was allowed for one person. And he writes, And I find I can now believe again that he has done vicariously whatever can be so done. He replies to us as we ask to suffer for others, you cannot and you dare not. But I could, and I dared. What do we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? Who did not spare his only son? Why does Peter write to a a group of suffering Christians and tell them to anchor themselves in the word of God that ultimately leads them to the goodness of God? Because in that, they will see a picture of the gospel. And that is the only way that suffering makes sense in our world. The only way that suffering makes any sense is not that we have a God who didn't ignore it, who didn't deal with it, but that we have a God who came down and suffered in our place for us greater than we will ever, ever suffer. None of us will take on the wrath of God like Jesus did in our suffering. There are questions I have about God that I cannot answer, especially about suffering. But there are answers I have about God that I cannot question, especially about his goodness. Do you have a dying hope or do you have a growing hope? Three points as we close. A growing hope in God is accessed in the gospel. When Peter writes, look at verse, verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 22, the beginning of verse 22. Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth. He's talking about the truth of the gospel. The beginning of verse 23, since you have been born again. He's talking about being born again because of the gospel. Look at verse 25. 
but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. He's talking about the promise of the gospel. And the church didn't intend to do this, but in the Enlightenment, when we came out of the 17 and the 1800s, all of our focus on the gospel and into the first great awakening became on conversion. The gospel was this great experience. It was this great feeling that you had at Ponca Bible Camp, even. Everybody has this great gospel experience. We trust Christ, and then we get into the Christian life. So we we have the gospel back here, but then in the Christian life, we move past the gospel, and we get to the truth of discipleship and to growth. The truth of the gospel, because of this, is, is extremely limited. The gospel became something specifically for the kids that we send to Ponca. It becomes something that we deal with when we're converted, but not when we're growing in Jesus Christ, and that is totally and utterly wrong on every account that is wrong. We go to the gospel to come into the Christian life, and we go to the gospel to grow in the Christian life. We will never exhaust the truth of the gospel and its ability to help you in your Christian walk and in your, in your Christian growth. Listen to Keller. He says, a lack of deep belief in the gospel is the main cause of spiritual deadness, fear, and pride in Christians because our heart continues to act on the basis that I obey, therefore I am accepted. If we fail to forgive others, that is not simply a lack of obedience, but a failure to believe that we are saved by grace too. If we lie in order to cover up a mistake, it's not simply a lack of approval. So we do not get saved by believing the gospel and then grow by trying hard to live according to biblical principles. Believing the gospel, he says, is the only way to meet God. It's also the only way to grow in God. So we bring the truth of the gospel to every aspect of our Christian life. We never stop exploring the gospel. We never come away from the truth of the gospel. Peter is writing to believers about the gospel. And so we dig into the truth of the gospel. The gospel contains the simplest of truth for an unbeliever and the deepest of truth for a mature believer. It is the way we get in. It is the way we grow. Growing hope is accessed by the gospel. Number two growing hope affects our relationships. Now, if you are alive and breathing and you have a pulse, at some point in time, the five sins that Peter listed in verse one of chapter two have crept into your life, either knowingly or unknowingly. Show me a person who's never been deceitful or hypocritical ever in their Christian walk. And I'll I'll have to show you Jesus is the only one who did that. Peter, here's what happens in my marriage. Brandy will ultimately ask, that was, a, that was awesome. Is that you, James, a little eraser? Ethan. I should have known. I shouldn't have, ta- shouldn't have gave the illustration about you. Something just flew up here. Came from my kid, so I'll, f- I'll forgive him today. Kayla, what are you doing over there? Are you babysitting? Or? It is 11.35. The hour is getting late. Forgive me as I talk about these things. Here's what happens in my marriage. You know, we deal with these sins all the time in our marriages. We deal with hypocritical love to one another. We deal with deceitfulness in our marriage. Brandy will ask me something super simple. Hey, Jared, did you remember to grab the loaf of bread at the grocery store when you went? Did you remember to call that person that I asked you to call this morning? And instinctively, instinctively, I'll say, Oh, yeah, 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 I did. I grabbed it, and then I turned the car around halfway home because I forgot it. I just, I don't want to be truthful. I want to, like, portray the fact that I'm the perfect husband, that I'm not somebody who loves hypocritically, that I don't live deceitfully with malice and, and all these other things in my life. And the truth of the matter is that I do deal with those kind of stuff, those kind of things. Peter is not telling his readers You'll grow if you don't sin in these ways. He's telling them, don't try to hide your sin when you deal with it. It's been dealt with on the cross. Confess it and deal with it. Take out the garbage. Relational depth happens in community, not when we cover up, but when we open up and become very vulnerable. And so today in our marriage, more often than not, Jared, did you make the call that you were supposed to, that I asked you to make today about insurance or whatever it was? I blew it. (laughs) I'm so sorry. 
I will, I will dial and I will make this call right now. Please forgive me. I made another mistake in my marriage. And you know what? Brandy appreciates that so much more than any kind of cover-up job. She can see right through it almost all the time anyway. C.S. Lewis says, A Christian is not a man who never goes wrong, but a man who is enabled to repent, to pick himself up, and to begin over again after each stumble because the Christ life inside of him is repairing him all the time, all the time. Number three, finally, drawing hope is anchored in God's goodness. Do not believe the lie that God's goodness means that he will protect you from suffering and chaos. When Jesus ended perhaps his greatest sermon, he gave these words. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came, the floods came, and the winds blew against that house, but it did not fall because it was founded upon the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into the practice is like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. The rain came and the floods came and the winds blew against that house and it fell and great was its fall. Everybody, wise men and foolish men, both experience the same storms in life. The same suffering comes upon the believer and the unbeliever. The test, the cash value is, will you stand under the power and the grace of the gospel in Jesus Christ and the goodness of God? Or will you fall and try to hold up the structure on your own power? Wise way to live and a foolish way to live. Folks, this is the growing hope that we have in 1 Peter. We're going to transition chapter 2 in 1 Peter. Now we're going to move to some community truth, some hope in our community. And so for the next few weeks, I hope you'll come back and, and listen to that as we continue the great campaign, a theology of hope for exiles. Let me pray and we'll be done. Father in heaven, again,